Welcome to One Earth United, where we salute indigenous artists here in the US and around the world. I'm Cynthia Arnold, and it is my pleasure to welcome Zija Fazli, who is an entrepreneur, a producer, and the founder of Face Pakistan. Welcome. Thank you so much. My name is Zija Fazli. I'm the founder at FACE, Foundation for Arts, Culture, and Education, uh, whose mission is to strengthen and empower communities through the language of arts and through cultural interactions. Pakistan has always had a rich culture um, and a, a rich history in traditions. And I'm wondering how you honor this through, the, through FACE Pakistan. Yeah, well, so Pakistan is a diverse country uh, to start with, I mean, we have five provinces and each province has different uh, language. And in fact, if you go down to the languages, we have uh, more than 70 spoken languages in the country and each language is different from the others. So for example, I cannot understand the rest of the 69 languages that, uh, that exist in this country. And that shows the diversity and that shows that how uh, uh, different yet uh, you know, together people are in a small geographic area. Uh, we have a population of about 220 million people. And so having such a diversity, uh, you know, the, the cultural uh, scene is also changing. As soon as you go from north to south, uh, the whole, whole fabric of culture is changing. I mean, there, uh, there are different sounds, there's different uh, uh, artistic values and the different, uh, you know, let alone you have to you don't have to go outside pakistan to different to experience a different culture you can still being inside pakistan you can experience so many different cultures here um, what face has been doing to to actually honor that as you asked uh, we've been uh, we've been involved in lots of uh, cultural programs uh, primarily our flagship program is this festival that we do it's called the face music mela and we've been doing it since uh, 2014. So uh, technically, this should be our seventh year of the festival. But then, um, unfortunately, in 2020, we could not hold the festival because of, you know, COVID and everything. But uh, we started in 2014, and it started off with a small festival, starting off with like 5,000 people in, in three days. Small festival. Uh, and then, yeah, well... <laughs> so, from the beginning, I mean, now it's it's twenty thousand people in, oh in, uh, in three days. So I mean, I mean, uh, still for a city like Islamabad, where we come from, it, it is yes big, but uh, you know, talking about bigger festivals, like I've I've been visiting other bigger festivals in the world. So sometimes there are like hundreds of thousands of people who come down, but uh, from Pakistani perspective and from global perspective, it was a good beginning for, with five thousand people. But then it moved, uh, it, it got bigger and bigger. And we, uh, on the sixth year, we were, uh, we were attracting 20,000 people. But then on the fourth year, we also traveled the festival to Hunza. So, so as I mentioned before, the Pakistan is a very diverse uh, country. And in the north, uh, there are uh, mountains. And uh, I think uh, out of the top 10, uh, you know, biggest mountains in the world, I think more than five are in Pakistan. So the Karakoram and the Himalayas and all the ranges are, are you know, uh, in the north of Pakistan. And uh, it's a beautiful terrain. It's a beautiful landscape. And lots of mountaineers and people come down for tourism purpose uh, in the north. So we took the festival to the north uh, to promote tourism because we feel that cultural tourism is also one of the most important areas that need focus in the country. So we took the festival to Hunza and call it Face Mela Hunza. So the festival started traveling. So uh, it started off with Islamabad, then it traveled to Hunza. And in the meantime, another interesting thing happened was that we took the took uh, like a delegation of musicians to South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. And that started off in, the, in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 15, 16 and 17, three consecutive years, uh, we together we took about like 70 musicians to South by Southwest and uh, did a Pakistan music showcase. And uh, one of the worth mentioning thing is that the mayor of Austin, while 
you know, we were doing the showcase and the mayor noticed the, the activity going on because we were covered by Washington Post, New York Times, uh, Billboard and all these. So uh, the mayor proclaimed March 14, 2015, sorry, 2016, as the music of Pakistan day, which was a good achievement for us. So, I mean, we, we were spreading around all the indigenous musicians to uh, using our platform of festivals and use, using other festivals to c connect with us. And so we, uh, you know, traveled the showcase to different other parts of the world. Uh, this is one of the major thing that we've been doing uh, to honor the cultural scene here. Uh, besides the festivals, we also uh, made a documentary film, which is called The Indus Blues. And um, that film is actually, it's a 77 minute long feature length documentary that, that won four international awards. And that film is actually talking about the plight of the indigenous musicians, how uh, difficult it is for them to, uh, to survive in this present day music industry where the contemporary music has gone completely electronic and, and it's all digital uh, platforms and digital medium. So that, I mean, I remember the days when we started off with the cassettes and with the LPs and, you know, uh, but now the new generation doesn't even know what a cassette is. And, uh, and yeah. so the indigenous musicians cannot also relate to the new, new age uh, music industry. So what, what we're doing is first we are identifying the problem that uh, what's going on with the indigenous, indigenous musicians, what are the challenges that they're facing? And that was done through this documentary film, Indus Blues. And then as a phase two of that documentary, we uh, did a residency program, which was held actually almost like um, uh, four months ago uh, in, in August in Islamabad. So we selected about 20 indigenous musicians and trained them on, on social media and trained them on, uh, on promoting themselves on the digital platforms, onboarding themselves on various digital music platforms. Uh, so it was all, all equipping them to be able to uh, converse with the present day music industry, which, which, is, which, is, which is very fastly changing and uh, evolving. So that was another initiative that we did, which was in the shape of a residency. And uh, at large, uh, to sum it up, what we want to do is to create platforms where the indigenous musicians can relate and can, uh, you know, connect with the uh, the contemporary audiences and the contemporary musicians. Because otherwise, it's very difficult for them to survive. And uh, if they're not onboarded on the digital platforms, nobody would notice them. They would not make their children learn the same music or same art and uh, gradually it will it will uh, you know it will go into extinction which is very alarming yes i know so how ancient are these instruments i know they're you know that 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 the musicians are using in some of you know their performances yeah so uh well the oldest instrument which since, uh, as I mentioned before about the documentary called Indus Blues. So the Indus civilization, it goes back to 2000 years, 3000 years. So uh, in this part of the world, uh, there have been, still there are, uh, you know, remains of uh, certain uh, utensils and certain instruments that we can find in the museums. Uh, and some of the instruments are, are going back 2000 years. There's one instrument called Borindo, which is from uh, the Sindh, uh, the area which is in the south of Pakistan. And that is kind of like an ocarina. I don't know if you, if you really know what an ocarina is. It's kind of like a clay, uh, a clay ball, which has holes in it. And so one can blow and then make tunes out of it. So it's, it sounds pretty much like a flute but it is actually made out of clay. And that instrument is almost like 2000 years old. And uh, today, the last manufacturer, or you can say the last maker of that instrument, an artisan, and uh, the last performer is left in, uh, in this time. And he is not really willing to pass it on to his children. Uh, I mean, he is willing, but then, but then his children are not going to make a good livelihood out of it. So he's not very confident that if he's putting his children into this activity, 
would he be uh, making enough money mm-hmm. so that instrument is now endangered so is the last generation who is playing it so uh, to answer your question yes like 2000 years plus some of the instruments are that old well when you speak about the diversity in pakistan how would you describe the music it's probably just as diverse um is there a certain tone you know like yeah listening deep in from their throat or how would you describe yeah. it yeah so i mean most of the instruments uh, in this region are more folk i mean it's we call it the sound of the soil so it's more like uh, um more uh simpler in in tones i mean for example this uh, instrument borindo i was telling you about it's got only five tunes five notes and uh, uh and uh, similarly other there's another instrument called iktara which means it's like only one one wire one string in it and so uh, he plays it with a finger holding it like this especially the the performance that you'll see of uh, wahid baksh uh, later on uh, he's using that instrument called iktara so it's just like one string and it's he's playing one string which creates a drone kind of an ambience so most of the int- instruments are rather more simpler in nature and more more uh, and, and not very complex uh, or numerous in notes so they have limited notes and more um, you can say more uh, basic sound which is which relates to the soil or which relates to the to the uh, nature around them so because back in the days uh, people used to live in villages and in villages it, it was more like a person sitting under a tree in a in a desert or in in some some terrain and is singing a song for his lover or maybe for you know uh, for the audiences so uh, so it's not a very complex orchestral or very very you know um, complicated music it's it's very simple that one can anyone can relate to to that kind of a sound so so far there are like 23 instruments that we have through our research figured out that uh, that are getting endangered and that are indigenous to pakistan um, and some of them are really really in in the category of endangerment uh, we we are trying to preserve them promote them and doing our best to to you know sustain uh, those uh, musicians who are playing them so how do you i mean is with covid you know i would love to have a festival here and showcase the the musicians and the, the ancient almost artifact um instruments you know i mean how how are you coping with this right now during covid the challenge of covid are are you doing i guess virtual performances or yeah so well um lately during the whole covid period what we our our major project was uh, was holding this residency uh, which happened in in august last year so throughout the year we worked on selecting you know the right candidates or the right musicians who would be part of that residency and then not only training them to uh, to be onboarded we made sure that they get a certain stipend for uh just to you know make sure that during that month of residency they're at least making some money and then uh, most importantly we uh, made videos um out of uh, you know when I, when they got together we actually produced on spot uh, produced 10 songs and made videos of, uh, of those 10 songs and those 10 songs are on our channel now called uh, heritage live it's a youtube channel and then there is another a uh, channel which is recently opened in pakistan called rinstra which is actually monetized monetizable channel so we it's called rinstra r i n s t r a it's an indigenous you can say a local uh, youtube similar channel and uh, that channel is monetizable so i mean uh, when they are putting their stuff uh, stuff stuff on that channel so they are making some money also so we're trying to create opportunities for them to make make more money to to be able to survive and yes uh, talking about virtual performances thank you so much cynthia you you have uh, actually uh, made this happen that uh, one united and face 
this uh, new collaboration is, is very unique in the sense that uh, now these people can be heard uh, cross border in US and across the world. And so, which I think is very important for them to be able to survive and to, to actually carry that flag for our generation because uh, it will be very shameful for us if, if we are not able to do or give back to those musicians and, and um, preserve this, uh, this culture that we have in, the, in our heritage. So yeah, this is what we've been doing, having virtual performances, especially in collaboration with One Earth United, and then having a, a residency program that we finished last year. And we're looking for more opportunities. We're actually now waiting if the dust is settled, if this Corona thing is over. We're already planning a festival in July in Hunza. In fact, just like 15 minutes ago, I finished a meeting with some relevant stakeholders of, about that festival. Um, Where is it? So we're in process of designing that. Where yeah. will it be? It Where will be it? in Hunza. Okay. Yeah, in Hunza, in the, in the north of Pakistan. So okay. uh, because we want to look at approachable uh, places, one, number two, um, that is one area where the corona cases are very less. So we are hoping that by July, the corona will be much more controllable in that area. Plus, mm -hmm. it's a, tourist, a twisty spot. So when the corona situation is better, people are kind of fed up of sitting at home. So they would want to go out and visit such, such festivals. And so we are thinking uh, to hold it over there if everything is fine. If not, then what we'll still do is that we will have the festival in small, small locations. And it's not going to be a huge uh, 10,000 people at one place. So it's going to be one activity is happening at one place, one another place, so that the corona protocols are also COVID protocols are uh, taken care of and uh, there is no risk of uh, any you know spread of COVID. So this is what during this time what we have we've been trying to do. You know, it was interesting that, that you mentioned the the musician with the ancient um, clay instrument. I can't remember the name. Um, and uh, Borindo. Pardon? Borindo. B O R I N D O. And how he was concerned that his children, it wouldn't be. Yeah profitable for them. So how yeah. you, have you found it difficult for young people to really practice the culture? Or is that is it different in Pakistan where they still feel proud of who they are? And what would you recommend to people watching how they can teach young people to appreciate different their own culture as well as others? Yeah, well, I, I think in my opinion, um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to teach someone to appreciate one's or anyone else's uh, culture because it's, it's kind of like a very human connection. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's just like love. So it's very difficult to, to, to teach somebody to love. You know what I mean? So in my opinion, it's... Uh, it has to come from within the, the values and the, the roots that one is coming from and then how you can relate to somebody else's roots is something that has to come from within. And uh, it's more like of a, of a spiritual nature, you can say, uh, having more intrinsic value of who you are and where you come from and how your ancestors were like and what what is the actually the sound of the soil and the, the uh, region that you were born in. And so uh, first is it has to come from within, which, uh, which will come only if you get an opportunity to, to view it or to feel it. Because if you don't ever get an opportunity to view or feel it, it will, will probably not uh, come, you know, ignite within you. So uh, the best, best way to teach somebody would be to create opportunities for the person to go and see this is what your culture is like you know um, and then how how one can connect with the others i feel that uh, looking at our culture and looking at different other cultures there's always a similarity and there's always a connection there's always something that one would say that hey this is this is what we do also hey this is how it's done at our place also and so um it's a very universal kind of thing and and 
Hence, uh, some politicians are also using cultural diplomacy as part of their campaigning, but then, uh, but then uh, at least they're recognizing it, which is a good thing. So I think that connection also comes natural. But then again, there has to be more and more, there have to be more and more opportunities for people to experience that culture. And that is the only lesson that they would get. That's the best way to, of teaching them. Yes, yes. It's interesting that I see Jimi Hendrix behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, since I play guitars and I do rock and roll, so. But I've been <laughs> experimenting with, uh, with, my, with the indigenous musicians and I've been playing rock guitars with the indigenous, which is, again, another interesting collaboration or interesting thing that we will discuss uh, later. Uh, because I feel that the, the youth uh, is listening to the new contemporary style of music. Yes. And all of a sudden, if you tell them to listen to something else, people are very choosy and they're like, no, 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 it's not my taste. So I, I, I don't want to listen to anything. But yes. if they're listening to, for example, EDM and in that electronic music, you can hear some different sound of, of maybe some indigenous music instrument, then they would like, hey, what's that? So, I mean, they need to first... Uh, you know, whatever the popular style of music is, which the youth is listening to, uh, very smartly without losing the authenticity of the indigenous instrument, if that can be collaborated with the contemporary music, that's a good way of um, uh, letting the youth know about the, the indigenous sounds. Yes, I've noticed, um, you know, I, I work with a lot of indigenous um, tribes in the United States and they're very into hip hop. Yeah, own version of hip hop, and it's great, you know. It's and great, that's, yeah. It's building pride in the young people, and in their yeah, culture, yeah, yeah. and that's so important. So I love what you said as well. Um, let's see. Do you have um, any upcoming events other than what you've already mentioned, um, or maybe what the the embassy is doing to honor the beauty of your ancient culture? Uh. Well, there, there are certain things in pipeline, but uh, since it's not uh, matured yet and it's not oh. something that we have uh, formally, you okay. know, uh, everything is in place and now is the time to formally announce it. I think it'll be a little premature for me to announce a couple of things which are in pipeline, but I can all, always tell about a vision at large, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, which are, well, which ha which is like a two prong, you can say. One is that we uh, at FACE, my personal vision is to establish uh, FACE as a as an institute, uh, academy or like learning institute, which will have uh, uh, films, which will have music, which will have dance, uh, which will have visual arts. And so these kind of disciplines, like a proper school, you know? Yes. And uh, because unfortunately, in the capital, we still lack a proper uh, international standard school. There are some in Lahore, there are some in Karachi, which is like four hours drive. Lahore is four hours from Islamabad and Karachi is by air two hours. So lots of uh, students from this area and especially the North, they, they, uh, it's difficult for them to, to access education um, and they have to travel a long distance by road. To, to reach to a reputable uh, you know, school or institute. So I am now in a process of uh, uh, imagining. So it starts with the imagination first, <laughs> imagining a, a school yeah. here and then uh, see how it goes. So eventually somehow the other, you know, if there is a school proper institute and probably affiliated with some university in US or maybe any other part of the world where we can, uh, actually get the syllabus because we feel that uh, uh, if the syllabus already exists, we don't have to create a new syllabus. So if we can get the syllabus or the curriculum from there and we can have a formal education here and uh, also design our own curriculum for the indigenous instruments because that would be very specific to these instruments. And that way we can preserve and promote our indigenous culture as well as have uh, more creative uh, people coming up and participating. So, so this is one vision, and the other one, rather more shorter term, would be that uh, to create more collaborative uh, 
opportunities where the indigenous has a chance to meet the contemporary and then they can you know do something together because uh, this way some people would say the authenticity of the indigenous music will be compromised in my opinion it's not so i think there are lots of people who are experimenting music and then music is always evolving and so some people want to see it in untouched original form that's fine but then the youth is more experimental and then they probably want to experiment more so uh, in in our upcoming activities we'd want to do more and more collaborative style of music where the indigenous is meeting the contemporary or one indigenous is meeting the other indigenous as in from a different country maybe and so that way you know they experiment more and uh, have more visibility also that is brilliant now will that include art and dance as well because i oh, have yeah. some connections you know that would be fantastic schools yeah. of yeah. people i know that i'd love to recommend Great, great. That'll be great. That'll, that'll be, and this is exactly what. Interested? Who? How, how do they get a hold of you? I guess they can contact the, you via. You you can be uh, the face of face <laughs> in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> yeah. So one and one Earth United and Face can collaborate on this one, and it'd be lovely if we can come up with something like this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I'm, I'm so excited. Um, I think. We'll be doing. We'll be airing it on February twenty first. Okay. On my on One Earth United website at All right. seven p.m. Eastern Standard mm -hmm. Time, and then we'll work out Perfect. a time also for for your website as well. Super. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add here that uh, it's a it's a great work that you are doing at One Earth United. It's a, and uh, I was just discussing it with the my colleagues here that uh, your ideas and your passion to uh, for the indigenous music musicians and the indigenous culture is uh, commendable and and uh, your your new ideas which is like this virtual passport which is very you know um, you can say it's a very unique idea which uh, i think would work best because there are lots of people who'd want to uh, help these musicians and who'd want to see these kind of uh, virtual, you know, performances. But then there were never any initiative where this could, the artists could benefit from from it. But to, through this way, I think it is a very unique idea. And uh, thank you so much for uh, thinking that way and for, you know, believing in uh, FACE and these musicians who are uh, from Pakistan and uh, who many people would get the opportunity to to listen to and see in the future in the next uh, you know uh, broadcast when we do it so thanks so much and uh, i think i think we'll do more and more of this in future excellent thank you so much thank you